Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. Great to have you here. If you've come in via YouTube and want to know more about what we do, it's easy. Just head on over to officehours.global. That's kind of our primary web portal, and it'll get you all sorts of information and links about the show, how you can participate if you'd like to, or just more details about what we do here and why. Um, by the way, there's a YouTube, uh, or not a YouTube, there's a QR code that we use now, and it's just a popped up on the screen. It uh, a, takes you directly into a place where you can put your questions in for the show. If you happen to be new here, um, our show is entirely driven by your audience questions. And that means that if you shoot that QR code with your phone or type in askofficehours.com, that'll get you to a quick portal where you can put your questions for the panelists to deal with into the show. And that will get there the fastest way. It's a kind of a little two-step process if you use the QR code. But that or get into our Makana system. And the, the fun of that is that you get to vote on the questions and push them up or down depending on your preferences. So that's how it works and how the show functions. Today we are doing two hours of Q&A. So it's a great opportunity to get questions about tech, about anything having to do with putting video on the web or audio or lighting or anything else you want to talk about. That's what we're here for. We've got a great panel of experts today who will be uh, addressing your questions as we go along. That's all happening in our second hour. Uh, Mark, let's get started. What's our first question today? Thank you, Bill. Our first question is from Funsak Dorje in Dharamshala, Dur India. Please explain what does it entail, equipment-wise, to live stream a Zoom meeting of eight participants. I believe we would need Zoom ISO. Also, Zoom OSC and a Zoom account. Please explain the workflow. Well, this is a pretty complicated one because there's a lot of possibilities, but Chris Fenwick is going to start us off this morning. Chris? I would recommend uh, you go to your YouTube, rewind about three years, start watching Office Hours from the beginning. No, I mean, it, it, it's, a huge, it's a huge undertaking, but there are many ways to do it. You can go totally top shelf. You can do a, a totally uh, bargain basement. We were literally just talking about this guy, um... Uh, his name is Brandon Peltz, and he's on YouTube. Uh, live stream mastery, I think, is his is his uh, channel. This is a great video he posted a couple weeks ago, and he goes through step by step, almost cable for cable, how he sets up a Zoom meeting uh, to to um, live stream it. Uh, this is kind of top shelf, although I still think Brandon should use Zoom ISO. Look at all that pack out; that's cool. Anyway. Um, you could also just screen scrape the, the the gallery view and send that out. So there's a lot of ways to do it. You have to like pick your budget, figure out where you want to, you know, how much you want to spend. But uh, Brandon's a super smart guy, and this is a great video. I just started watching it right before the show, and I it's 18 minutes long. I got a minute and a half into it. I'm looking forward to watching the rest of it. So if you're really serious, there you go. Lots of uh, possibilities there. I think it can also be done very much simpler. Maybe we'll talk about that as we go along too. Uh, Guy, take it over. Yeah, that's some heavy, heavy iron there to be pulling in all those feeds. So eight laptops going into a constellation with a bunch of decimators. I mean, that's one way, one very expensive way with a lot of knowledge, but it, it works. You know, it's, it's going to work every time. You've got a Zoom laptop running Zoom and you're putting it in, but to quote Andy Carluccio in 2023, nobody should be screen scraping a Zoom meeting to push it in. So there's Zoom ISO. That's one way of pushing the feeds in and isolating them. So that's a Mac mini with a sonnet box. Now vMix 27, the beta just uh, was released this past week. That's another way you could download that. And now you can pull those people in and you'll have your eight wirecast. Uh, next version 16 is coming out with, uh, uh, they just tweeted or Jeffrey posted right on X uh, that uh, they'll have that Zoom integration that was announced at NAB, but it's coming up uh, really soon now. Uh, Mimo Live does it now on the Mac, so that is one of the coolest ways. That is solid in shipping. It's not beta. That is uh, final build. So that'd probably be next to the uh, next way that I'm going to say that'd probably be my my top recommendation for simplicity's sake. But not everybody's going to love this other solution, but uh, production studio for 99 bucks a month from Zoom. So you can populate, there's nine up layouts right there inside of uh, production studio. Benefit of production studio, you get 1080p without any huss or fuss. You just, 99 bucks and you got your 1080p, 720p and 360 in one meeting. It's the only software that will allow you to do that. And you could change your backgrounds, uh, which is a lot of what people like Greg Gibson have been doing for years using vMix and Zoom Rooms. So that's another way of doing this is 
Zoom Rooms and NDI out of Zoom Rooms. So Zoom Rooms in the PC, we, we did this a lot with the cloud. So we would take those NDI feeds, each isolated person, and suck them into a Zoom meeting. So it just depends on how complicated that you want to get. But I would say start with Production Studio because it's just super easy. You get 50 different scenes that you can populate, and you get your screen shares. You set them all up. You got your cool wallpaper backgrounds. So it, it just looks really nice and polished to have that. And it could be a meeting or a webinar uh, for 100 people. It's um, 99 bucks a month, and then you can just push that out. If you get 101 people, you just push that out to YouTube, and there's your live stream. Or you could push it out even with one person. So that's probably the simplest way and most cost effective before you start dipping into the heavy iron. But watch Brandon's video that uh, Chris recommended. That one's great just to kind of get you a, uh, an idea of the lower thirds and things that he's using it for with a stream deck, but you can do those lower thirds in production studio too. Excellent. I'm glad we had something at the top end and something that's more affordable and easier to get into. Jeffrey, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, it's a lot of stuff, Guy. Just covered a lot of it. A couple things that I will add to it. First of all, make sure that you have, don't do not do it all on one PC or one Mac or uh, in, in the Zoom ISO case. Uh, always have something uh, split or maybe even something for a backup because you never know what's going to happen. Also, make sure that you have more than enough internet to do that. Make sure that uh, if you're using Macs uh, that you've got at least a 10 gigabit per second uh, uh, Ethernet plug uh, in there. That way you can, uh, that you're not bottlenecking on anything. And when you're doing it on the computer, just clean, have a clean profile computer. Don't use your regular profile, set up a secondary profile, just wipe everything from that machine. And so there's no other program that's trying to update. There's no other program that's running in the background or, or anything like that. Uh, and you'll have a, a pretty decent thing because there's always going to be a problem. Somebody's going to have a camera that goes down or you're going to lose connection somewhere. And you're trying to avoid that on your end. Last thing is always use your Zoom credentials, not somebody else's Zoom credentials. That way you can control everything about the Zoom uh, and you don't have any problems and you're not locked out of screen share or anything like that. So much good information here. Hopefully that was helpful for you, Funchaka. I will say that I, it, I'm going to go around to the three people who have answered so far and just ask a simple question. What are the top three priorities you'd look at to achieve success in this? So Chris Fenwick, what are the first three things that you must have to do a basic Zoom meeting like this and have it succeed. What What are your thoughts? Uh, did you just throw me an audible? I did. Uh, first three things. Um, yeah. It, would it be connection the, first and then equipment the, or something? On the producer end, you need to have uh, an organized work environment so you don't get flustered. I, good good I, advice. My, the, 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 the core of my... Uh, uh, career starting 40 years ago was live broadcasting. And if you're not organized, you're, you're just going to have a bad day. And a bad day in a live show is a really bad day. So be organized. <clears throat> get equipment that you enjoy working with, that you like. You don't want to have to work with something that you just get angry with. And then on the um, on the sender end, you know, your participants, do all the... Uh, What's the word that Alex, uh, ball handling, you know? Oh yeah. Basic you? ball handling skills. Can I skills. hear you? Do you, do you look, do you look like a, a, a real human, you know? <laughs> yeah. You're not in the not dark or you're not <laughs> looking at the scene. You know, I like to tell, uh, people when I'm talking them through fixing their shot, I don't want to see your floor. I don't want to see your ceiling. Figure it out. Okay, good. So good. Some basic stuff. Guy, what are your top three things you'd give somebody for advice if they needed to stream? A, a good run of show so you know where you're going end to end so if you have any graphics to prepare or anything like that you know who's up who's gonna who's gonna be where and at what time uh rehearse if possible so that you get a proper run through so you know uh who's gonna fall apart or what's gonna happen uh, ahead of time so you can kind of prevent those things and and uh be ready to cut to something else in case they, they drop or something like that so uh, bandwidth and connectivity because sometimes you you take on a person and they're in one place one day and the next thing you know, there's like, I got to take the call from the airport or something like that. So connectivity is why I love the cloud. And a lot of us hosted stuff in the cloud because these feeds would come in and you get enough of them and they just, they'll saturate your home connection pretty quick. So being able to have high bandwidth is 
uh, one of the the, the biggest tenants of, of uh, AWS is you're getting 3,000 megabits a second in and out. So it, it's one thing to have 100 at your house, but once you get eight people, you're, you're soaked. So yeah, run a show, rehearsal, bandwidth, connectivity. Oh, good audio. Nice. Yeah. And uh, Jeffrey, finish us up here. What are your top three to get it done? Uh, well, first of all, you're coming. I'm assuming that you're in India and you were, will be uh, doing something in India. And hopefully, the eight participants will also be in India because band, as Guy said, uh, bandwidth is a big thing. But when you're doing bandwidth, when somebody's in Norway and another person's in Ireland and another person's in wherever, uh, latency can really start to affect uh, whatever you're doing. And of course, their computers, you don't know what their computers are. If they're running a uh, high-end MacBook or if they're running uh, something that came from 2018 because they just haven't had time to do any type of upgrades. So cameras or anything like that, uh, being well organized. And when it comes to eight person, if you, you, it's best to have help because that's a lot of juggling of the balls. And if you you can find people that are even virtual, you can call, give me a DM and and uh, we can work out a price and I can help you uh, help put this whole thing together. But uh, when you're juggling eight people, that's going to be really tough. So getting some help is very important. Okay, you've got a lot of wisdom there. Hopefully, Funchak, that helps you understand uh, some of the details. And we hope your uh, event goes off swimmingly. Let's get to our next question. Our next question is from Adrian Watkins of Wellington, New Zealand. When I'm monitoring, monitoring audio on the Mix Pre, my PC via USB, I always get clicks when the audio peaks. Looks like it's clipping on the Mix Pre display, but not on the Scent Audio. Any thoughts? Chris Fenwick, start him out. Adrian, uh, I was conferring with Mickey. I want to always give credit where credit's due. Uh, one of the first things is you want to make sure that all your sample rates are set the same across your work environment. When you're working with video, you're working at 48 kilohertz. Don't touch the 44.1, okay? Uh, make, every, make sure everything is that. And you're going to have to learn some basic uh, gain staging. It could very well be as simple as that. You need to know how to, you know, set up and monitor tone all the way through your system. I have a mix pre-6, and there are times when my gain stage gets a bit wonky because I'm always adjusting things, like I might have to take a phone call or listen to something. And and you, here's what happens. You get everything set up right. It's great. You pull something down to listen to something else. <clears throat> you push it back up, but not all the way. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, I don't hear something. You grab for the wrong knob to, to turn it up. And now all of a sudden your, your whole gain stage is wonky. So you got to keep tabs on that. Every once in a while, I have to like calm down and look at all my, you know, faders and put things at Unity and whatnot. So just be careful about some of that basic audio stuff. Courtney Gooden. Yeah, what Chris said. I mean, it could be a level issue and it could be a USB issue. I've been experiencing clicks and pops uh, lately in Windows 11 if you are on a PC. Um, because and it is a common problem. You'll notice here from the Windows uh, uh, help. Uh, you know this is from Microsoft Community. You know audio device issues in Windows 11. A lot of people are hearing these clicks and pops uh, on uh, Windows 11 and, and the most recent versions. Uh, I am hearing these clicks and pops, and occasionally you will see my video breakup, which is coming in over USB. I believe the problem is with certain uh, chipsets in certain motherboards of certain PCs, there is a buffer overrun issue, and uh, it's causing dropped packets uh, and dropped uh, video frames, etc., every now and then at certain frequencies based on when the buffer is overrun and wraps around. They use circular buffers, so it, it defines an area of memory to use, and USB is asynchronous, so it always throws stuff into a RAM buffer somewhere in your PC, and it pulls stuff out at a different rate as which it goes in sometimes. And so when that buffer overfills, uh, it wraps back around and starts overwriting the beginning of the buffer. And sometimes when that happens, uh, they have to update the address of where that buffer is to be writing and reading. And sometimes when it crosses a certain boundary, it will get lost for a few frames. And you'll get clicks because it's confused. The packets don't arrive in the right order. The cadence gets off, so you hear pops. A lot of people have solutions they've tried is uh, 
deleting the USB drivers for that uh, object in the device manager, if that is your case, and letting Windows restore it, that might fix it. I reboot, and sometimes the clicks go away for quite a while. Uh, and then eventually they creep back in. So uh, that may be what you're experiencing. If you're hearing the clicks and pops, and they're not, they may just be coincidence that they're landing on a peak, or if it's showing up as a peak, the pop. It, oh, look, see, there was a, there was the glitch, the US key peak glitch. Thank you, guys. You demonstrated it perfectly on my on my feed now with the video. So uh, every now and then it will happen. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So the uh, the peaks could be gener I mean the pops could be generating the peaks on the meter of the Mix Pre Three. So it may just be coincidence that the pop is creating the peak and not the peak creating the pop. So get your peaks and pops straight. There you go. Hopefully that will help you, uh, Adrian. Uh, thank you for being here today, and we're going to sneak on to the next question. Our next question is from Jonas Dattel. What is the least expensive way to receive SRT to HDMI? Samuel, and, uh, Samuel Nordvik is going to start us off here. Samuel? Yeah, well, the way I've done it in the past is using a old laptop and uh, bring v uh, the SRT feed into vMix and then just outputting it over the uh, the output. I'm sure that if you had uh, like uh, one of the mainly quieter threes or something, then uh, possibly that would be a powerful enough to output a couple of feeds. Uh, I am. I also believe the OBS can output it, SRT. Okay, so you probably need something in between to do the conversion. It sounds like I'm hearing, and uh, SRT, Secure Reliable Transport, is it, a lot of people use it, so there must be ways that people are getting it into an HDMI signal. Guy, do you want to go farther? Yeah, Samuel said the two cheapest ways uh, and most reliable, just like in um, our show that we did with uh, IBC, we were using vMix, as Samuel said, with uh, with the, well, in this case, it was an SDI output, not HDMI, but that's a cheap way. It's $60 a month. OBS will also input. And then if you have an, a, a monitor, you can just uh, hook into a laptop HDMI out. Uh, BirdDog this week announced... Um, a firmware update for this little device, which is um, called the Play. So this thing for 149 is the cheapest hardware box. Um, it looks like this on the on the uh, web UI where now. So originally this was an NDI box. So you would you would take in NDI and you would convert it to HDMI, and it was really cool for that. But now the uh, new version, as of this week, uh, works with uh, not only their cloud service but also SRT direct in. So you can receive SRT. Another way is um, an Apple TV. So if you have an Apple TV, there's something called High Vision Play. So if you need to do 4K, the High Vision Play on a like 100 and I think they're 169 for an Apple TV, you probably get an even the older ones will work, work well. So that's a couple different ways. Jonas, I hope that helped. Let's move on to our next question. Our next question is from Brandrum, Brandon Buttram from Indianapolis, Indiana. Courtney, can we get a State of the Union agreements update? Yeah, as everybody probably knows, Hollywood is still uh, at least in major part on strike here. So, Courtney, what have you been hearing in local? Uh, well, the uh, the writers have settled theirs. They're very happy with their deal. Uh, they um, The actors, not so much. Uh, the latest, uh, uh, they had gone back to the table and they were uh, bargaining up until about a day or two ago. And uh, at last report, uh, here's the statement from the uh, negotiating committee from SAG-AFTRA. It says, with profound disappointment that we report the industry CEOs have walked away from the bargaining table after refusing to counter our latest offer. We have negotiated with them in good faith, despite the fact that last week they presented an offer that was shockingly worth less than they proposed before the strike began. So the producers are going you know, down and the uh, actors <laughs> are going up. So uh, they are not agreeing and they are no longer at the bargaining table and have not scheduled a resumption. So it doesn't look good. I'll be heading out to that picket line later today. There you go. So it, it yeah, it, it, when you have a, a labor dispute like this, parties getting farther apart is generally not a good sign. So we'll keep our fingers crossed after the Writers Guild strike. I know the, so much of the pipeline uh, they were planning, you know, it's going to be months before we can get content, start producing it. But now they're running into the second strike. So 
we may be uh, bereft of new content, at least coming out of the U.S. system for a while. And, and I might add that uh, they strike authorization for the game producers, which is a separate contract with SAG-AFTRA, so actors and uh, voices for games. Uh, have authorized a strike there. They haven't gone into negotiations yet. Their contract has not yet expired, but it's coming up next. Uh, so they got that to look forward to, too. Jeffrey Powers, you wanted to weigh in on this. Yeah, Courtney, I have a side question for you because tonight, uh, Saturday Night Live is going to be restarting, and they got special permission for their cast to actually uh, be able to do that. Of course, uh, Pete Davidson, I believe, is the host, and he can't talk about his whatever projects that he's working on, is my understanding. But could something like this actually, uh, first of all, if if you can explain how that works, that where they can use that. And then secondly, could they all of a sudden just take that away and all of a sudden everything that they worked for for the week just completely put on hold and Saturday Night Live doesn't happen tonight? Yeah, they could withdraw their waiver. Uh, but uh, usually if they, they agree to pay certain things, and I think that may be a different contract, uh, live television may be different, which is why all the news anchors and stuff aren't out on strike. Um, they're under a different contract, I think. Uh, it's whether or not they're observing picket lines is the problem. If there's a picket line around the uh, you know, 30 Rock, they may not wish to cross that picket line, even if they're working under an, under a different contract, which is what was going on with the writer's strike and for a while with some performers who were, were not necessarily uh, under strike, but they were observing their brother union's picket lines. Uh, so I'm not sure whether that, that I haven't, I don't know what the contract they're operating under at NBC for live, a live show so they, like that. I, what I read was it was the same SAG after a, uh, uh, union for mm. Saturday Night Live. So that then they got special permission. That's all I am. Well, it's I the same expect. union, but there's different contracts. So it depends on the contract that they're working under. But um, although it's all SAG-AFTRA, you know, they have different contracts for different types of performances. Theatrical production is one type of performance. And and uh, promotional stuff, advertising is another. You know, it's all SAG-AFTRA, but advertising is a different contract. And game game. Uh, voice and, and acting, game acting and voices is a different contract. So, uh, and they can get a waiver. They can grant a, wa grant a waiver to a specific show if everybody agrees on it. Uh, and usually they will meet the demands of the uh, striking party in the waiver, although it's not, it's just a temporary waiver. It's not permanent. All right. Hopefully that uh, added a little clarity. I know everybody uh, is always hoping that everybody goes back to work and feels like they've gotten what they deserve. Uh, it's a tough negotiation, but here we are. Let's get to the next question. Our next question is from Vincent Alvarez of Bellingham, Washington. It's been about 15 months now since AI has been talked about heavily in the general public. What technology leap caused this dramatic leap? And John Proto is going to start us off here, John. Not sure exactly if I'm reading this question correctly. I can tell you what happened with AI and what caused the, the ruckus with AI. The the text to image models came out last uh, about last summer, and that's what started everybody talking. But not until ChatGPT in November 30th did did it really take off. So that that's the trajectory. Okay, so it was an introduction, a lot of press and coverage, and then. Uh, it got down to the nitty gritty of it. Courtney? Yeah, what John said, I think ChatGPT moved it out of the closet. It was closeted research, but it wasn't exposed until ChatGPT let the cat out of the bag. And now all the, everyone, nobody wants to be left behind. So they're, they're pouring a lot of money and a lot of effort into increasing it, uh, increasing the, the size of their large language models, et cetera. And the other thing that, uh, a lot of uh, hardware manufacturers are now incorporating AI cores into the hardware, tensor cores or whatever you're calling them, uh, neural networking cores. And the latest Apple Silicon and in the uh, latest Intel Silicon is incorporating separate cores to do the integer math that's uh, used for uh, handling the large language models and the AI stuff inside. So that's accelerating things. And I think I, I read or saw that uh, they've now started regenerative AI, so where the output of one AI is consulting several other AIs and they're coming to a consensus, and so that causes a regeneration loop, which vastly accelerates uh, and refines the answers 
uh, to get uh, more and more accuracy built into it. So that's accelerating things. So I think it's just a matter of rapid development, uh, feedback where the AI is checking the AI, uh, and uh, that regenerative loop causes an exponential increase in uh, speed and popularity. Not necessarily speed, but accuracy. Hopefully things in my end have stabilized. I went away there for a second. It seemed like CJ Covell. Uh, the other thing that's super interesting to me is that it seemed like ChatGPT came out and caused a bunch of noise, and then everybody, whether they, you know, ready or not, they had to unveil whatever they had so that they didn't look like they were out of date. So uh, because because of that almost readiness of it, it's caused a lot of rapid iteration in ChatGPT and the competitors, and so it's definitely kept it in the news and kept it a buzz. There you go. Chris Fenwick finishes up. Definitively, this is a slow burn ramp up to, to uh, 2024, which will be the 40th anniversary of the Terminator movie. This is, <laughs> this is all publicity. So this is Skynet creep. Is that what you're telling us? There we go. Okay, that's pretty frightening. Uh, those of you who have questions in the queue, thank you. If you want to put questions in the queue, remember we are open for questions the whole way. The, the quickest and fastest way is to use the QR code on your screen right now in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, or just type in askofficehours.com. You can put a question in that way. Or you can go through the traditional method and uh, pop into Mukana, our question and answer system, where you are also able to vote the questions up and down. So regardless, thank you for your participation. Um, there was a note here. Also, today is test day for HDR. Uh, so if you want to check out the YouTube stream, maybe a little different from our weekday shows. That's because we are constantly using Saturdays as our test bed. So uh, if I have extra resolution and color, I apologize to you. Nobody wants to see that. But we're still going to do it because it's more important to test things than to uh, artificially lower resolution so that we all look better. Anyway, that's that's my two cents. We're going to sneak into the next question. Our next question is from Funsak Dorje from Dharamshala, India. Hi, panelists. Thank you so much for answering our questions. I have a G2 HDMI encoder from Killaview. I saw SRT TS pushing in encoder configuration. How can I make use of it? Does restream? F Facebook and YouTube support SRT. Guy Cochran's going to help us out here. Guy? So none of those will readily support SRT, unfortunately. So YouTube has a beta program right now that uh, some of us are, have access to and we're feeding SRT feeds. But the, the real benefit of SRT is when you go to H.265. So that encoder that you have will do H.264. So unless you need SRT for a specific reason, and those two reasons are speed, so latency, getting it there fast. So SRT is faster than RTMP. So it'll get there faster, get there more reliably. But then the other benefit is H.265, which is half the bandwidth of H.264. So if you want to use a KiloView encoder, the next one up is the S2, and it'll go to H.265. Now you need a place to point it to. And those places right now that we just talked about, Facebook, YouTube, Restream, don't do it. The way that we do it is we go to the cloud. So we put a an SRT receiver up in the cloud, and that'll be Calaba Cloud, SRT Mini Server, High Vision Gateway, and then we suck them in, or we could use vMix, and we suck them in, and then we can spit them back out in H.264 RTMP to YouTube. So we go up and then over. The benefit of that is that the cloud's super stable. So if you have multiple feeds, a lot of people do this where they're doing something where their feed may not be super reliable. So they, they take... Um, let's say even a 750 kilobit, just a tiny little 720p stream coming out of the field in H.265 over SRT. And it's, it, looks, it looks good for what it is, but RTMP would be like chunky and falling apart and you'd get like these pixelated globs every once in a while. So those are the benefits. Right now, I don't think that you, you need any of those. So I would say just stick to what you're using and uh, know that that's the future though. SRT is the future with H.265 and cloud and all that. And soon YouTube will accept it natively. Bill, back to you. You're muted, Bill. Can't hear you, Bill. 
Your Zoom, your Zoom muted, Bill. Okay, and yeah, the, my system is going a little wonky. For some reason, it keeps shutting down and rebooting. So, uh, Mark, you're the reader, so just be prepared. If I seem frozen or something like that, sneak in and grab it at the moment until I can get back. Will do. Question. Roscoe Jones from Madison, Indiana. Creative Triangle, resources versus technology versus creative ideas. When does the tech or resource limitations stop the idea? Or does the idea change to fit the limitation? I think Bill's having some trouble. I, I think I'll, so. So I'll who's... jump in on this. Um, Roscoe, I think it's a great question. It is the it is the core of what we do. It is the marriage of technology and storytelling, although I don't I hate that term. It just got overused a decade ago. But what we have to do as producers is bring that stuff together. A great producer knows how complicated what we do is, and they will start early. Uh, a bad producer will think everything is super easy. And so we, we all have to kind of bring that, that focus together between the ideas, the resources, and, and, the, and the, uh, the technology. Um, the more time you have, the more iterations you have, the more polish you can get, and the better your, your end product is. Um, something's going to give good, fast, cheap. That's the way I like to describe it, um, it's, which is a little bit different than what you're saying. And uh, of those two, good, fast, and cheap, you, I always say to my clients, pick two. You only get two of those. Thank you, Chris. CJ? Yeah, the other thing that I'll say is remember the, the axiom of just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should do it. Uh, is the decision that you're making uh, to embrace the technology or try something new, is it serving the story that you're trying to tell? Is it serving the message? Uh, and are, is there an ROI uh, for whatever additional complication that you're putting into that system? Or is it just because we're, we're nerds and we like to tweak things and play with things and see what we can do? Uh, but yeah, but remember, your message is king. All right, it looks like Bill had to drop off, so I'll go ahead and jump over. We'll go ahead and take the next question, Mark. Okay. Uh, I think Courtney had a, yep. a response. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, the, the triangle isn't necessarily a equilateral triangle. It's uh, it's changing rapidly, and uh, advances in technology in the last couple of years have affected creativity with artificial intelligence now being able to do creative things and the technological aspects of computer-generated imagery, either by artists or by AI, has removed a lot of the uh, roadblocks to creativity. Is now that if you can think it, you can put it on the screen these days. Uh, so we're no longer necessarily limited. The only limitations is budget now. Really, is uh, is there enough money to throw at a project to use the latest technology to guide it to completion? So, uh, as the sides of the triangle are changing, you might have to. Uh, divert more energy into fundraising than into the technology of of creativity. Uh, so I find, and as we advance in the technology, it reduces the cost of creativity as well. So it's hopefully working its way back to equilateralists uh, as we go, thanks to the technology. All right, next question. Our next question is from Paul Wallace of Austin, Texas. If you have a beta, a beta version, whoops, that question just appeared. Sorry about that. Alton Christian from New York City. Is there a way to test the new Zoom features of Mimo Live with the available feeds? Much like, okay, much like the Zoom ISO test room offered in After Hours a while back. You know, on this one, that was something that uh, we discussed at uh, Zoomtopia, actually. there's They're definitely aware, uh, Zoom is aware that people want to do this, and they have their own ways of testing themselves. It's it's interesting. Um, we wanted to bring back that feature to After Hours, but uh, all those drones are, they're dedicated machines, so it's it's hardware, you know. it's uh, Somebody needs to put each one of those feeds to, to send them up. So there does a, there's a desire out there. It's just a matter of who's going to, 
put up the money because it's machines and bandwidth to keep that that running. Hopefully, uh, we'll see somebody out there that uh, is willing to to put up that that time and energy so we can have those Zoom drones because Wirecast is coming out with one uh, with the ability to bring in Zoom, uh, and we want to play. You know, we want to be able to have these these mock participants to suck in and move around and picture in a picture and all that. Uh, let's go ahead and take the next question. Our next question is from Paul Wallace of Austin, Texas. If you have a beta version of Sonoma, is it easy to downgrade to a non-beta version? What's the process? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, yeah. So basically what you have to do is you have to go into the system settings and within the system settings, there's the software update area. And then you'll have, and then you'll have a checkbox for uh, do beta updates. You uncheck that. And sometimes that will work. Sometimes that won't work. The better thing to do is, uh, first of all, uncheck the box and then, uh, and then basically just re reinstall everything on, on the Mac because that way you're, got your best clean version. Go ahead, CJ. Yeah, uh, they claim that if you unenroll the device and you say I, uh, what Jeffrey had said, I do not want beta updates anymore, then the next release of Sonoma or whatever the software is will upgrade you to the non-beta version. But I'm kind of with Jeffrey on this one. I get nervous to go into beta and go out of beta. I'd rather start it up in recovery mode, erase the computer down to nothing, back up obviously first, and then start from scratch. Then you're just going to have a lot of less weirdness. But I'm going to throw uh, two links in the chat from beta.apple.com on how to unenroll devices and restore. All right, thanks for that, CJ. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, Richard Bird from New York City. When traveling where the host only allows one device to a Wi-Fi point, is there a portable solution to create a private network and connection for more than one? I've been told that in some of these cases, the provider looks at Mac, not just IP. Go ahead, Jeffrey. So when I travel, I use a little uh, portable router from a company called gl.inet. And what that does is it connects up to Wi-Fi and then uh, replicates for other Wi-Fi devices. Uh, so uh, like, for instance, a hotel. Now, the, there, you have to worry about one thing, that's the, the when the device gets connected up, that MAC address that you're talking about, uh, what it will do is it'll come up with a page where you have to do a login or anything like that. You have to make sure that it's passing through to the next computer so you can still fill out the credentials so you can use it. And GLINet uh, and some of these other portable routers like that will also will have instructions on how to do that in the settings. But in the settings on the router, there'll be a, a way that you can go from there. The other times what I do, uh, what I've done is when I connect the router, I'll connect up my phone as a separate uh, entity into their Wi-Fi to get the page. And usually it's an IP address. So then when I use, when I connect the uh, iNet router and then I connect a computer to the router, I can use that same IP address and it usually passes through so I can put in any of the credentials. Awesome. Yeah, those things are super cheap too at the low end. I believe they're under $100. Uh, which model did you get, Jeffrey? I still have the Slate 7. I bought it when it was a CES uh, uh, Innovation Award, uh, was it 2019 or something like that. They now have the Wi-Fi 6 models. In, and if you buy any router nowadays, get a Wi-Fi 6. Don't go for the older versions. Yeah, I was also seeing some of those... Um, that at the $400 level that'll do uh, advanced uh, VPN uh, and uh, bonding. So um, look at their website. They have some new offerings besides that one, the Slate that's super popular right now. Uh, Samuel. Yeah, I just want to say plus one on the GLI net. I have the one I think I paid $45 for it and it works very well. It's not like the most uh, advanced or powerful router ever, ever but for a small port portable router, it's very, I'm very satisfied with it. Awesome. All right, let's move on to the next one. Our next question is from Douglas Carmichael, and he wants to know our thoughts on Emirates Airlines starting to use generative AI for crew training. Oh, John Prado. The number one use in the enterprise for AI right now is in customer support and training. 
there's a training company here that I'm affiliate, affiliated with in Las Vegas. And the clients there, only 80% of the clients that engage with the platform are successful because generating content is so difficult. And so using that for generative AI for training is spectacular. So you see those two uses, some amazing customer support applications coming down the pipeline right now. Go ahead, CJ. And if they don't have to pay as much training staff, then they can afford to keep putting Penelope Cruz in their TV commercials. <laughs> nice. All right, let's go to the next question. Our next question is from Roscoe Jones of Madison, Wisconsin. I mean, I'm sorry, Madison, Indiana. Does anyone here go to see films about tech? Did anyone see BlackBerry? What tech stories have most inspired you? Courtney's going to take this one. Go for it, Courtney. Oh, I don't know what uh, Tetris was an interesting film on the uh, the it wasn't necessarily on the tech because you know it was written in basic I think original Tetris was but it was uh, about the negotiating and all the uh, backstabbing and uh, crooked deals that go on in the industry uh, when something becomes popular suddenly. Um, the tech takes a back seat. But uh, I, I have always been frustrated about tech in movies because uh, having worked in <laughs> on tech in movies, uh, I'm always frustrated by how the art director depicts the technology that is supposedly real technology, but it's an art-directed version of it. So, you know, you see lots of screens that everyone's sitting in front of and nothing but scrolling text going up on all of them and, and things flipping around and doing stuff with no interaction to them. And supposedly that's, that's what high tech looks like. No, we all know that screens don't interact unless you're asking them to interact, you're requesting them to interact, you're looking for something. They don't just suddenly start presenting all this information too fast for anyone to read. So that always drives me nuts is the art directed uh, implementation of what tech is in a movie. It's, uh, it's not real. So I'm curious, Courtney, on that note, have you seen any devices that have been used that are flashy, blinky things that we know as like sound people or just geeks that that's what that really is in real life, but they used it as some some device uh, as a prop. Oh, I, I see it all the time. I'll I'll take uh, if I have a, a DVD or a video of something, I'll freeze the the text display that's going up, and I'll go, oh, I recognize that code. That's you know basic code from uh, an AOL page from years ago, and it has nothing to do with cracking the nuclear secrets of anything. You know, so it's it's. Uh, uh, some movies will try and get it right. They'll hire a, an, an actual uh, tech person as a consultant to make sure that the screens read correctly. And there are a few directors that make sure that happens. But unfortunately, most of hacking and cracking and all that stuff, you know, it's like somebody sits down at the keyboard and we're in. You know, that's not exactly how it happens. It takes a lot longer and be a lot more boring. So to progress the storyline a little faster, they take a little dramatic license and uh, make the technology uh, do what they want, not necessarily what it is actually done. CJ, go ahead. The other thing I feel like that happens is that you've got these you've got these really great um, like business dramas, whether it's we work or sorry we crashed or social network or or, or Tetris or Blackberry or even the the Jobs movie that was the uh, Michael Fassbender Jobs, not the <laughs> not the Ashton Kutcher one. It's the technology makes it that it familiarizes people with the business so that you don't need to explain this is what the company does, this is what they're all about, and this is why we should care. When you see a company that is like the, the BlackBerry movies, the rise and fall of BlackBerry, and then they cut to all of the executives watching, you know, the 2007 iPhone keynote, and they're all just, you know, shaking in their boots. You're like, wow, I mean, this was this is high drama. There are people. It, it just raises the stakes, I guess. So I, I like that it, that that dramatization of these real world things that mass market people actually have familiarity with is really cool. So A plus. All right, Jeffrey. So when I go to see a movie like this and I really, I don't want to be entertained. I want to be informed. I will go for a documentary over anything because, uh, and, and there's certain things you just can't show like what Courtney was saying, but more to the point, you know, if you've got, if you, if you're actually hacking something, 
the one thing that the movie makers don't want you to do is uh, go home and actually use those techniques that they're doing on TV to actually hack something in. And uh, so then there's certain things you just don't talk about uh, when it comes to movies. So for me, like I said, documentaries are where it is. It's still a point of view rather than the, what actually happened. But I find that when you get several points of view, you find a good storyline that goes on there. One that uh, I, 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 I was very particular to was the one uh, that came out in 2016. I got to interview uh, Rod Canyon from Compaq on it because uh, he was one of the executive producers. And this was Cowboy, uh, Silicon Cowboys. And if you want to watch the entertainment version, you watch the TV show Halt and Catch Fire. But if you really want to find out what happened with Compaq, you watch uh, Silicon Cowboys. No right, pirates in Silicon Courtney. Valley? <laughs> no. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I, he stole my thunder there. I was going to mention Halt and Catch Fire as a good dramatic representation went on with com what went on with Compaq. Um, so, uh, but the other one that you mentioned was the more accurate, the documentary was more accurate. But uh, the dramatization was was over dramatized and halt and catch fire. But the uh, technology depicted and the steps depicted are pretty accurate. All righty, that wraps up that one. Let's go over to Tyler's question, Mark. Tyler Roberts from Chambersburg is looking to upgrade some Panasonic AW HE60 PTZ cameras with something that will more closely match Canon C200 cameras. He has a $15,000 budget for camera and controller. Ooh, Samuel, you want to grab this one? Yeah, well, uh, since you already have a Canon uh, camera you want to uh, match it to, then I would uh, perhaps look at this here, the CR uh, N500. It's a $5,000 camera, so you could get two of them and a controller within your budget. Uh, so that's what uh, probably be uh, my uh, recommendation if I was going for a PTZ camera. But I would also like to mention that you can get this here motorized uh, uh, head. So perhaps if you if you wanted even higher quality within your budget, you could look at those options. Nice. Yeah, this is where going to an NAB or an IBC or one of these trade shows is super helpful to go and look at the pictures, talk to the engineering folks because... There's, there's a lot to it, especially with all the tracking that's coming down the line, if you need that. Otherwise, you know, FR7s look really good. All right, let's move on to the next question. Our next question is from Paul Wallace. At 79 grams, is the X-Real Air a cure for neck or back pain from looking down at your phone or laptop screens? And is it the best TV projector monitor alternative? Go ahead, CJ. So I don't, the other day when Guy recommended this, I don't even think uh, they went to the next question before I had this in the cart. It showed up in three hours. So uh, they're a little clunky. It's a little big. Uh, the one thing that is interesting, though, is if I turn, if, if I unlock, I can't use Face ID with this now, but if I put an image on the screen without those blinders, you do see a little tiny reflection, if you're looking closely, of whatever I'm looking at through the lenses. Um, the one thing that I find tough with it when you're using an iPhone or even an iPad is that the uh, you can't look at your phone. You you don't have a mouse. Like when I'm using the when I'm using the computer, it's great because I can just you know I have a cursor. But if you can't actually see what you're doing, you've got to be really good um, to make that happen. Uh, but the the other nice thing is it comes with this little blackout. Uh, plastic cover for it so that way uh, if you did want to have something that was completely dark and just focus on your screen you could see that I'm uh, taking a five-hour flight on Monday and I'm very anxious to see what this is like for several hours but so far wonderful and what do you think of the picture quality CJ I'm curious oh yeah picture quality is uh, it's pretty good I found that it was a little high contrast like a little over the top on some things but then you know, as I as I'm looking at, it, I'm like, yeah, but okay, this is a little tiny screen that I'm looking at through a glasses. Like I'm almost more blown. I'm so blown away by the that they've managed to put this in such a light package that just if, if the picture quality isn't you know over the moon good, then uh, I'm it's not it's not causing me that much disappointment. The one thing is, after an hour or so, it does get a little warm. Uh, I've noticed that that's my only uh, my only complaint so far, but 
No, all around, I like it. Nice. Go ahead, Jeffrey. So the real answer to uh, the cure for neck or back pain is actually called physical therapy. And this is not, this is not a way to relieve on anything. Uh, and, and of course, they don't make, hopefully they don't make any claims that this is going to help your back or, or help your neck uh, uh, heal or, or feel better. Um, you're still, from my understanding, you still have to, if you're using a computer and you're using it as a computer screen, you're still going to have to be in front of that uh, keyboard and mouse so you can move around and, and type. So with that, the be yeah, you, you definitely, when you have something like this and, and you're more free to do things, you might find yourself doing a little bit more of this and that could actually, uh, it, moving around is important, but it could also help a hurt as well as help. So uh, the best thing, like I said, the best thing to do is to do your physical therapy. I have, uh, as some of you know that a few years ago, I suffered from Bell's palsy. I have a thing called synkinesis. It's basically where this side still feels the effects of Bell's palsy and you have to retrain the muscles. So almost every day I'm doing exercises uh, and uh, I'm applying heat to make sure that I can actually talk to you guys and sit in front of a computer because it there are days where it's just super painful. Over to you, Courtney. Yeah, and unlike the Vision Pro, uh, unfortunately, this doesn't make your wallet as thin. Uh, so uh, you may still have back problems from sitting on a thick wallet with the new X-Reel. The other thing is if all the... Uh, Panelists start using them instead of our teleprompter displays. We'll all look like Ray Charles here. You know. Nice. CJ? The other thing that I was going to mention was that uh, if you aren't a touch typist and you need to look at the keyboard while you're using the computer, these are not for you because you will be... A, in, you're going to look down at your keyboard and the whole screen is going to look down at your keyboard. And that's kind of frustrating. But if you don't need to look at your keyboard and mouse while you're typing and you can kind of get into a more you know ergonomic position that's uh, not going to not going to uh add to the uh, strain on your neck then go for it all righty that wraps up that question and uh, I, i'd say uh yoga as well jeffrey uh is a, is a big one for back pain um I don't know if I could handle more than two hours with these after, after watching some movies on them. It, it's cool because I have the beam as well. So with the beam, it's another device that plugs into it that'll give this, it'll make the screen even larger and it, uh, it makes it so you don't have to have a phone or a device plugged into it. The beam is the device. So it basically makes it like a casting uh, receiver. So it, it, it's a little gray box that also has uh, the ability to add apps. So it comes with two apps on it that are just like a game and something else. But, um, it's it's really cool to have this this 120 to 200 inch TV in your room that doesn't have that kind of space. You know, uh, it's almost overwhelming in some of these rooms when you put it on and it just takes over everything. And then you could pin stuff when you have the beam, so you can have three screens and you could pin stuff. And then it's true. Um, uh, it, it's it doesn't move when you turn your head. So oh, it's it, got head tracking, so it's immersive or. Exactly. AR. So you, you might want to look at that, CJ, just to add add more to the the uh, the expense account there. All right, Thank let's uh, jump over to the next one. Our next question is from Adrian Watkins of Wellington, New Zealand. I reached out to contacts at the BBC who confirmed the dual inverted lav mics are for plosive avoidance and resilience, and also help when talent has long straightened hair. Yeah, this goes back to a question from the other day where we were talking about why the BBC has uh, some of their mics inverted and plosives can come down depending on how people breathe and their nasal uh, breaths can can hit those. So you'll see it's more popular in Europe than it is over here. And then the dual is, yeah, resiliency in case one, one uh, goes out, which is pretty rare, but you'll see some people have dual lavaliers. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Our next question is from Douglas Carmichael. If you have an iPhone 14 Plus, is there any solution for recording the Blackmagic camera to an external storage device? Go ahead, Samuel. I don't think there's a way to do it on the 14 directly, but what you can do is take the HDMI feed out of the iPhone and capture it with a uh, 8M Extreme ISO or ISO model, and then you have it uh, on a st storage device there, but not directly from the phone. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. I'd I, man, I'd say to clear up some space so that you can use it natively because you lose some of the benefits of things like ProRes if you take the HDMI out. So that's a little rough, but yeah, that's another excuse to get a 15, right? All right, let's move on to the next one. Our next question is from Chester Sweeney of Las Vegas, Nevada. In these modern times, which is easier to tell which is real between two pictures printed of the same image, one digital, one photograph film? The picture was made with both cameras, one digital, one film. Doesn't one have dots and the other, or I don't know. Interesting question. Uh, Courtney, go ahead. Grab this one. Well, you can see the grain. It's easier to see the grain when you magnify a photograph than it is a digital because digital is anti-aliasing algorithms and stuff that handle uh, jaggies, uh, which is another giveaway for a digital if it has uh, jagged, regular, regular jagged edges on it when you go in and pixel peep and look at the very edges of the f of the photograph between things. But with dithering and things, there are, there are techniques, uh, electronic techniques, to dither and create grain. So it can become harder and harder. Uh, and as the resolution of the digital sensor goes up and up, you'll see uh, less, uh, less noise. Noise appears in a digital photograph where in a video, uh, in, in video photographic film, if you're talking about still film, that's something else. In photographic film, the grain changes. It's random every single frame. So it's easy to tell on a photographic, uh, uh, digital photographic film what is film and what is not, although there are now electronic means of removing grain in post-production. So that makes it even harder to tell the film from the video. But there are a lot of techniques that you can use to uh, determine whether it was film or, you know, digitally captured originally. Highlights look differently, et cetera. All righty, next question. Our next question came from the QR drop. Uh, Dan Proctor, Dan from Proctor, Minnesota. This may be a question for Jeffrey. How do I get an AMP SIM on my computer to play through a cabinet? Hmm, Jeffrey, go for it. So what he's asking for, uh, great question, Dan. Uh, what he's asking for is uh, an amplifier simulator. Uh, so basically you plug your guitar into the computer, the computer then uh, creates the uh, simulation and then uh, sends it back out to any type of cabinet. Uh, Soundcard will do a lot of that stuff, uh, but there are some, uh, some companies that focus directly on using the guitar amp. So you can also use anything uh, that, brings audio in and brings audio out uh, from, you know, like the uh, focus rights or, or anything like that. IK Multimedia and Positive Grid are the two leading companies when it comes to bringing music in and taking music out uh, for guitar work for keyboards and, and anything like that. They're getting into more of the USB connection rather than a uh, an analog uh, three and a half inch uh, plug because, of course, a lot of these laptops don't have those anymore. Uh, so you then plug uh, a device into the uh, in through the USB, and then you plug in your guitar into that. Uh, and like I said, it's more than just those two brands. And then, uh, and then just turn around and run the software. And then, of course, it'll go on the uh, audio out. You would then take the audio out plugs and then put them right into your cabinet. So fairly straightforward on that. Uh, thanks for that, Jeffrey. Uh, so coming up uh, next week, it looks like we've got uh, quite a show. Let's see. We've got Monday, Storytelling with Ian McCaig. Uh, Tuesday, we've got Lower Thirds, Fonts, Backgrounds, and Animations. Wednesday is Live Acoustics in Historical Spaces. Thursday, Camera Sensors, How They Work, What Makes Them Different, and Why We Should Weigh These Differences When Choosing Our Next Camera. Friday, OWC Talks. Jellyfish and Storage, new additions to the Jellyfish Shared Storage lineup and OWC Ecosystem. Uh, these will be discussed uh, as well as Thunderbolt uh, 5, USB-C on the iPhone and uh, Apple Connectivity. So it's going to be a, a great week. Hope that you guys can add your questions either via the QR drop, which has uh, been fascinating to watch how we can take in some of these questions and hold them. Uh, so before we used to have the refresh that would knock questions out at about three o'clock, but now you can use the QR drop. And those, uh, those questions have been uh, super helpful because we're able to uh, have these things remain uh, uh, 
persistent rather than just dropping off. So we're going to go ahead and get ready for our next um, hour here at the 8 o'clock hour here in Pacific Standard Time, and we'll do that now. All right, we're back with the second hour, and we're up with Paul Wallace's question. Paul Wallace from Austin, Texas. Can you describe the setup process for the X-Reel on the Mac, the PC, the iPhone and iPad, and the Android phone? CJ, you want to grab this one? Sure. Um, the nice thing that I, or I'm, I should say, the one of the things that I like the best about the X-Reel is that it is very... Uh, straightforward. There's not a lot of cute technological stuff going on. It's an HDMI display. So you plug it into anything that is USB, uh, USB C port. Your computer or your phone or your tablet's going to see it as an HDMI screen, and a couple seconds later, it's going to come on. Uh, the setup gets a little bit more involved if you're going to plug it into a computer and want to use the head tracking accelerometer that's built into the glasses. Then you're going to have to run a software. They have a program called Nebula that you can install on the Mac, or and I'm not sure if it can be on Windows or not, to have it fix that screen in space. So when your head moves, the screen does not. But that's in beta right now, and it's uh, it's a little glitchy. But but so far, most things that you're plugging into work very, very easily. Just plug and play. Yeah, it's pretty funny. I was out uh, to lunch with a friend of mine who's an um, Android guy. I'm, a, I'm an iPhone guy. Uh, and I said, hey, here, try these on. And he hooked up into his phone and his Samsung, I think it's the S23, it's the newest hot rod, whatever it is. And he's a big crypto trader and he put these things on and he he goes, oh, I could control it with my phone. So his phone turned into a like trackpad. So he was able to use it like a mouse. And so he just immediately was like, I'm ordering these because he, he, he does so much trading and he's in weird locations and he needs to see multiple uh, tickers and multiple screens. He's got like these 30 minute things and one minute things and, and they're he, they need to be big. And so for him being like in an airport or something like that, it was a godsend. So he's been using the heck out of them. Uh, but yeah, plug and play on most devices, uh, as CJ said. And let's go ahead. Oh, CJ, you want to jump back in? The other thing I was going to mention is there is a spot on their website where they list all of the phone compatibility for direct connection without any sort of adapter. So I will uh, I will throw that into the chat so you can check it out. All right, on the next one, uh, Douglas Carmichael. From Douglas Carmichael, CJ, can you get prescription lenses in the X-Real Air? CJ? You certainly can. I just brought up this video uh, from their website to kind of show you what comes in the box. So here are obviously the, the glasses that have the little screen on the inside and uh, has a couple of different nose, uh, nose bridge pads, uh, depending on the size of your schnoz. But then over here, the other thing that it comes with is a little template frame for an optician to uh, where if you can take it to your optician and say, I need lenses cut like this uh, to my prescription. And then uh, you will put those another piece of glass between you and that screen. The only thing that I worry about is the more pieces of glass that you're adding in there, the more sensitive your whole setup is going to be to reflections. So as much as I thought about that, I was like, I just got to wear contacts. Nice. And CJ, have you tried watching uh, Netflix where you get something that's more high high color fidelity because i find a lot of the youtube videos are are pretty smashed down have you tried watching like i watched taylor swift's concert and man it was like it was so sharp and crisp and real it was like being there i've got a couple of uh movies i 4k movies that i downloaded off of uh, itunes or i don't know if it's still itunes tv whatever uh, that i'm going to watch uh next week so I, i'll have to report back but i'm excited to do a little bit more than just a little demo i actually Everybody's going to make fun of me for this, but the first thing I did was like, I wonder what Excel looks like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think we found our, our geek factor here, Excel and the 120-inch monitor. Woohoo! All right. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one, Mark. Some of us would like that. Okay. Our next question is from Chester Sweeney of Las Vegas, Nevada. Trying to figure out how to Spotify my song out to the world. Donate proceeds to something. Tips, tricks, advice? Jeffrey, you got this one? Uh, yeah, well, uh, posting a song to Spotify is 
very easy. They, they want you to do that. They want you to, they also give you promotion tools because the more money you make, the more money they make, which in all reality goes to the second part, the more money they make, the little money you make. And that's the reality is uh, you might, you might have good intentions to donate all your proceeds, but you might find that your proceeds are less than a penny and donating that is just not going to do anything unless you know that this song is going to go viral in any way, shape, or form, maybe for a TikTok or, or anything like that, then you might get some serious cash. But uh, the, that's, that's the reality on that. If you want to do extra promotion on that, there are some, uh, there are some uh, third-party uh, groups that will help you promote your song. But you, in the end, once again, if you don't know it's a hit, you might find that uh, you're paying into the song more than you're getting out of it and then eat and then then you have to deal with the whole idea that if it does go viral then it gets compared against the national database of all these songs that are already written and if you if if your song matches something else there could be legal issues that that come into play i i don't want to discourage discourage you on this but that's kind of the reality uh so the best thing uh to do is to give you get a lot of promotion on it it doesn't have to be just Spotify that you can put it on there. If you've got a YouTube account that has uh, some sort of AdSense on it, or you can affiliate to uh, to Amazon, you can put your song up on Amazon as well, and then you can uh, link back to that, and then you might be able to get something. But once again, it's it's a really tough market to really make a lot of money, especially for a single song. Thanks for that. Uh, let's go ahead and take the next one. Next question is from Paul Wallace. Is the x reel a good reason not to have anything but a new iPhone with the USB-C connection? You know, on that, uh, Paul, <laughs> I was uh, lucky enough to have an iPad mini that I just got, the 499 one, which has USB-C and a longer battery life than the iPhone. So I've been using mine mostly with the iPad mini, uh, the newest version six, but yeah, I'm with you this dongle. So for those of you that have an older phone, uh, you have to go lightning to HDMI, then this adapter plugs into their adapter. So this is what Paul's talking about is it gets kind of, it gets kind of crazy that, you know, you have your goggles. Uh, I can't do this with two. You get the idea. It starts to become a thing when this thing plugs into that thing and then into your phone. It's like, yeah, you're on the airplane just making a big mess. But yeah, I like the iPad uh, with the USB-C in direct, but I do want the 15 so I can avoid all that. Here, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I had a follow-up question there uh, for you guys that actually have it. So you're saying uh, it's an HDMI display. So if you wanted to take a stick PC, let's say, that only has an HDMI out, uh, not a USB-C with video out on it. You have to have then provide the USB. It's pulling its power. The glasses are pulling their power from the USB-C input. So you'd also have to have that dongle. Does it come with that dongle that has HDMI input and a USB-C input for power? Is that how it works? CJ, you want to grab that? It doesn't come with an HDMI to US, an HDMI female, the USB-C male adapter. Although now that Courtney says that, I wonder if you could take the uh, like the adapter that you used Would to use be. when Apple first put us into Dongleville with the MacBooks that had only USB-C. You used to have to buy the USB-C and then it had HDMI and a pass-through power on the other side. I'm wondering if that'll work in the opposite direction. Yeah, and so, I'm wondering, since there is no power that comes out of the HDMI out, you'd have to get power right. to the glasses. They're always pulling their power over the same line as the USB-C video is coming in on. And that's a it's a male connector on the end of those. So yes. it's a $49 device that uh -huh. you could buy that's the adapter. And in the box, it, it, it has this little adapter that goes female to female HDMI. So when you right. hook that in, say, that right now sense. you can yeah. plug in your, your Nintendo Switch. And But this is powered, so it will run out of juice. It has three little... Oh, um, you mean it's battery powered, huh? Yeah, um, it's USB-C powered. So you charge it with USB-C. Before you plug Two in the internal goggles. batteries, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, what it really needs is another USB C port for charging while you're wearing them. That a lot of people yeah. have complained about. You're either about that. charging or you're watching. Exactly. But it, it lasts more than two hours uh, that I've found. Uh, so it's no problem. Uh, gotcha. Let's go ahead and uh, take the next one. Next one is from Douglas Carmichael. If you had to choose 
ChatGPT Plus or Claude Pro as your main large, large language model, which one would you choose and why? Preto. So I would poke around on Poe. Go poke around on Poe.com first because it gives you access to all of them. And, and it's accessed via the API. So you have more input tokens than you would normally have through the web interface. Uh, ChatGPT interface, it, their model is better than anybody else's. Cloud's advantage is input tokens now up to 100,000, which is a, which is nice if you want to train it with some large piece of corpus data that you have. But play around with Poe first before you buy anything. Yeah, I was really fascinated by this too, as we saw at uh, Zoomtopia that they announced their their own LLM. I'm curious as to how big those models get, because uh, I mean, some people host them themselves. Like how big. How big are these files? Do you know, John, have you downloaded any of these? Yeah, I have Llama. I have the mid-level Llama running on my machine. It's not that big. It requires a lot of RAM. And then um, and then Google announced that they're going to have a local um, LLM running on the phone. So the Pixel 8, did you get your Pixel 8 yet, Courtney? Pixel 8 is going to be the first phone. No, but I'm, I'm threatening. <laughs> with the with the local LLM running on the phone. So they're getting smaller and smaller. And some of the stable diffusion stuff you can run locally as well. So they're getting and better it, and tighter. That has to be the Pixel 8 Pro. Is that the only one? No, they both have the same yeah, processor. Pixel 8 yet. Pro. Pixel 8 Pro. Okay. Pro and John, is that why Nvidia stock? Processor. Is that why Nvidia stock went up so much is because of their hardware to do this? Could you yeah, explain the that? H100 one? cards and the A100 cards are the only thing that you can run these the giant models on. And the models are going to grow. The the CEO of Anthropic was on an interview last week. He's saying that the big models are going to be over a billion dollars to train those large models. So it's going to be impossible to compete with those giant models that they're building out right now. Man, it's an arms race. Who can get those cards? I mean, NVIDIA is holding the keys to the kingdom. All right, let's move on to the next one. Stefan Fischer from Würzburg, Germany. What makes wireless audio receivers consume so much more power than the transmitters? At IBC, we experience that with the Shure devices. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, I guess it, it depends. It depends on the type of receiver. And uh, in a transmitter, you don't have a lot of displays. At most, you'll have a little LED, usually, or an LCD display that doesn't stay illuminated all the time. That uses little, very little current. The... Uh, the trend these days is to put a display on the receiver that is a, a LCD or an LED uh, OLED display that stays on all the time and shows you, you know, a lot of information about your signal strength and battery strength, etc. Those consume a lot of energy that you don't have in your transmitters. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, you also have A to D in the transmitter if it's a digital wireless, and then D to A. In the receiver, and a lot of times the receiver will also be driving an output, which takes a lot of current. Uh, so it has to not only power the receiver, the battery power has to not only power the receiver, but it has to power an amplifier uh, to output an analog audio into headsets and or an analog audio output. So they will consume a little more power uh, in the receiver side than on the transmitter side. Next question. Next question is from Talalo Lopez Waterman in Phoenix, Arizona. Let's talk about color brightness dynamics on LED screens. When we use them in the theater, we want super smooth fades and long ones, even at low output levels. How do we keep them from stepping at lower than 20% part of the curve of a fade? Wow, no one's raising their hand on this one. This sounds a little complicated. Come on, Courtney, let me throw, throw you a hardball. You got any insight on this one? Go ahead, Courtney. Sorry, I'm trying to understand the concept of the question. Uh, dynamics of LED screens, it may depend on the color depth of the screen, you know, whether it's 8-bit or 10-bit. So the number of steps that it has uh, to go when you're doing a fade, it's going through all of those ranges, and you might see banding uh, as you reduce the number of uh, steps in the dynamic range of the LED. Um, when you get to the lower 20% part of the curve of a fade. Well, well, an interesting thing happens with LCDs, on um, not necessarily LEDs, but like a large screen display that's a LED backlight and an LCD shutter, is that uh, when you're 
working with an 8-bit display, the shutters are like uh, Venetian blinds. So let's say you're going to color correct a, uh, a LCD backlight that is daylight balanced to tungsten. So you got to take the blue channel down 70%, let's say 60%. So now uh, that little LCD shutter, which controls the brightness of the blue channel, is starting at about this angle here, and then you've just got this much to control the full brightness of the blue channel. So instead of, you know, from here to here, you've got from here to here. So that causes color shifts. Uh, when you get off axis, that's the problem of color correction in an LCD screen. When an LED screen, uh, I'm not sure what he's talking about there as long, you know, maybe it's the uh, the algorithm that's creating the fade is not using the full uh, bit depth of the dynamic range of the screen. I'm not sure what's going on there. Yeah, it's interesting because I'd love to see the this in action because it could be happening in, with the older tech of an LED screen or it could be happening with uh, the processor as well. So whatever's actually driving this thing, if it, if it is indeed the the components of the of the LED wall or the screen, then that's a different story. It's hard to you have to upgrade them, but it's yeah. It I could wonder... be the LED wall processor is only eight bit, and so you know when you're getting down to a low a very slow fade, you might be able to see the steps. Uh, you know as you reduce the bit depth. To all of please put up a little video uh, in Discord <laughs> so we can see what you're talking about and get an idea of how this looks in the chain so we can help troubleshoot a little more. All right, uh, let's go on to uh, Paul's question. All right, Paul Wallace from Austin, Texas. Enabot makes three smart home robots. Two wield tiny moving spheres with AI, audio, video, self-balancing, etc. Are these the most advanced home security bots? Whoa, CJ. I, I don't know about home security. These things, I think, look pretty creepy. There's the, I just went on their website, and it's like, hey, there's this little, it's going to dock into a Roomba dock, but it's going to go around and watch you. I guess if you traveled a lot, <clears throat> if you traveled a lot for business and you wanted to make sure that if your house was covered and you couldn't do it with just an Arlo cam or a, or a Nest cam or something like that, Maybe, but I just think if you have pets, these things are just going to get destroyed. But no, there's the cat there. Maybe not. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't know enough about the company to say I would trust them just to have a free roaming camera uh, in my house. <laughs> the future. All right, uh, Courtney. You know, the problem with the rolling robots is they don't like stairs very well. Uh, you know, if you have a multi-level home, this is not the robot for you. It can't roam the whole house. You've got to have an upstairs, like an upstairs maid and a downstairs maid. You know, you've got to have an upstairs security robot and a downstairs security robot. So I think the flying, who was it that uh, came out with the flying, uh, uh, was it Amazon, oh, the flying security robot that was a little hovering drone that flew around your house and inspected it and came back, mapped the house for you. That would be a little better because it could go upstairs, downstairs, rugs don't bother it or you know a sunken living room doesn't bother it uh, pets can't touch it although the cat may try and jump and grab it though that that is a problem uh so i think uh either legged robots uh security robots or uh, flying security robots are much more capable than anything that rolls around the daleks are your perfect example you know who would invent uh you know a hostile robot that uh, is foiled by stairs you know it's funny that you mentioned the stairs part because I actually used to have something called a, a suitable beam. And uh, this was before Zoom really took off, but it had the head of a, a big monitor and speakers in it, and you could drive it around. They were about two grand. And we put them in our warehouse to check inventory, but also for security. But there was a time when the alarm went off in the middle of the night and I didn't want to drive. It's like 20 minutes away. So I used the beam and I drove over to the, the uh, bay door and I started yelling like, hey, go away, because there was some kids banging on it or something that set off the alarm. And, but it was nice being able to drive this thing over and look at what was what was going on and hear it. And then be my, the speaker on the beam that I had wasn't the super loud one. They make a huge one that's almost like full-size human. Uh, if you Google it, you'll see what I'm talking about. We'll probably see more stuff like this in the future. Uh, I mean, as we go around the trade shows doing these things with the carts, that's what people were doing with the beams back before the company uh, got acquired. Uh, go ahead, John. Paul lives minutes away from the Tesla plant where they're building the Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime's going to come and kick this thing like a soccer ball out of the universe. OK, 
can't wait to see it. All right. Uh, looks like we got another question from Paul. All right. Our next question from Paul. Do you agree with the tech news source rankings on holtech.com? Let's see. John Preto. This is Paul's attempt to drive traffic to his website that looks like it's built from 1992. <laughs> Paul, you're busted. You've been called out by Preto. Uh, let's go to the next one. All right. Our next question is from Douglas Carmichael. I was reading about the Queen Adam Lambert tour and Adam Rose from under the stage on a motorcycle with a camera for bicycle race. How would they rig a wireless transmitter on the motorcycle and how would they deal with combustible fuel indoors? A wireless camera on a, a transmitter. Uh, here's one of those transmitters that uh, is from Axun. I mean, they're not very big. This is an HDMI one with four. Uh, this is about 500 to 750 feet. So uh, if it could hold that, then that's one way. Jeffrey, you want to add on to that? I'm going to talk about the second part, and that is, uh, well, most likely the motorcycle that he's probably on is most likely an electric, and then, of course, they're bringing in the sounds through uh, through the speakers of the motorcycle. But uh, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, like uh, many concerts and wrestling and, and all these other events that happen throughout the years, uh, where they had to bring in vehicles and motorcycles into the arena. Uh, these are finely tuned machines that uh, that don't emit too much, and and of course, they have a direct path, and they have uh, they have people there that are directing the fumes and monitoring to make sure that it doesn't cause any problems with the crowd there. So, uh, for that, and that that's basically what happens. All righty. And it uh, looks like we're running low on questions. So if there is any additional questions that you guys have, uh, go ahead and put them in the uh, Ask Questions dialog box. Otherwise, this will be a short, short show. Um, go ahead, Courtney. I was just going to mention the the motor of a single motorcycle shouldn't make much difference because remember they have uh, motorcycle races inside uh, dome stadiums these days and uh, as well as, you know, all kinds of uh, monster vehicles, monster trucks, and they burn a lot more gas and emit a lot more fumes than do the motorcycles, not to mention all the pyro that's used in almost every uh, musician's background these days that they're using. They're setting off all kinds of uh, propane burners and flash pots and smoke generators uh, that's far worse than, for the audience than a few seconds of motorcycle exhaust. So that is not a problem. And as far as camera, you know, I've got a lot of wireless cameras around here that are just, you know, security cameras. They have built-in batteries that'll last for three months and they transmit over uh, h.264 uh, over 2.4 gigahertz for it at least uh you know a couple hundred feet where they could put a receiver for it so that shouldn't be a problem go ahead cj and if anybody wants to see this in action for what it's worth highly recommend queen and adam lambert show uh, i saw it in amsterdam in 2015 and it was just uh it was just immaculate the uh they did a nice job of paying tribute to Freddie Mercury by putting, you know, video of him up on the big screen uh, for a couple songs without overdoing it and making it being campy. The one thing that threw me, though, was when, at least when I was growing up, when we did We Will Rock You, we would pat on our thighs and then boom, boom, clap, boom, boom. Over in uh, Amsterdam, they all went clap, clap, and then they put their hands like this. And I was, uh, we all thought it was the practical joke on the Americans, but man, that's a lot of people to get involved. <laughs> Uh, Mark Giuliani. Okay, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but most of the facilities that are the size that this venue would be in, you can adjust the amount of fresh air intake, and you can probably also adjust the amount of exhaust that you're exhausting from the building. So I don't think that the one motorcycle is going to be an issue when you have monster truck races inside these facilities at the same time. And Bill, you're back. Well, I'm sort of, yeah, hopefully I'm back. I'm sort of kind of. So it uh, looked like it was a bad or going bad Thunderbolt cable. Anyway, um, as to this question, I have been in circumstances where a wireless transmitter and a spark plug did not like each other. So the one kind of sound I have heard is on revving a snapping sound that increased with the RPMs of the motor. So it is possible for impulse noise coming out of things like distributors or whatever it was that was messing up 
to get into the wireless. But if it's not that sound, I don't think it may be connected, but just something to think about. All right, host is you, Bill, so you go ahead and... Oh, no, no, no. The, the back end is all plumb for you, so you're it just keep oh, going. okay. Well, let's keep yeah. going. Uh, Mark, you want to grab that next question for me? Okay. Paul Wallace from Reuters. India rolls back its plan announced on August 3rd to impose restrictions on laptop imports, saying the government only wants importers to be on close watch. Discuss. Hmm. Anybody want to raise their hand on this one, or we want to throw this one back to Paul for another day? Sunday. <laughs> Let's go ahead and go over to Craig's question. Okay. From Craig McFarland of Boston, Massachusetts, the x -Real Air, part of a trend for virtual monitors with AR, Roku Max, Quest 3, Vision Pro. Is the trend big enough to discuss the usage in an office hours second hour? That's a good question. I, I think it is. I mean, a lot of people are getting excited about Apple's product and then the the new uh, Lex Friedman episode with um, with Facebook's CEO shows um, where they talk about the Quest processor. The processor in that unit is a lot better than even the more expensive Pro version of last generation. So these things are accelerating. They're, it's going fast. I mean, I, I was uh, an early adopter. I bought a HoloLens for 3,500 bucks back in 2016, 2017. And I thought, I thought it was the future back then. And now when the X real errors came out and I tried them out, I'm like, oh yeah, this is definitely, this is definitely it. Being able to see things that big and handle that much information uh, in a portable environment. I think we could handle a whole second hour. What do you think, CJ? The other thing, well, I think you're going to get a lot of people that have the devices because for the same price as, you know, a, a decent quality computer monitor, you're getting this pair of AR glasses. Uh, this is not a $3,500 uh, Pro Display, Apple Vision. This is, you know, 340 350 bucks. Uh, that's going to get, an, I think, enough people who are willing to say, you know what, I'll take a chance on that. I'm not going to take a chance on 3500 bucks. At least I'm not. Uh, but I'll take the chance on something that's 300 350 bucks and say, hey, this could be really cool. It's it's one of these things where I got, I got, I tr when I played with one for 20 minutes, I, the first thing I thought is, okay, I know three people who could really use this right now. And it's easy enough to set up that, hey, let's talk on strategies on how can I use this to, you know, make things easier or make things better on a day-to-day -day basis. Or even if it's every now and again, just it's on the plane ride or it's on the train or it's when you're working remote and you don't have all your screens and you just want to have a bigger space. It's nice. Yeah, for camera use, um I have the feeling when Alex gets to really use his, he's going to start to think of other ways like I am. Uh, so my camera, the Z cam has a screen that's about this big. So when I'm out in the field, you cannot pull focus on a screen that big. So to throw these things on and check critical focus, especially with focus peaking. So depending on the device that you use with it. Um, so I'm, I'm using this, uh, Axun to, to get the HDMI across. And that gives me an app that gives me peaking and all of that, but you can use, um, there's a new there's a new app. Uh, it's called Video Assist. It's kind of expensive, but that'll also allow you to, with in the field to to uh, get these things like false color and things like that um, histogram. So having all the the luxury of these big monitors and big displays, waveform, uh, it's super handy. So I think that there is a second hour once enough people get these and start to go. Oh, I'm using mine for multi view. Oh, I gave mine to the client. Instead of them hanging out in Video Village, they can go off to the side, and I'm just NDIing them a feed, and they have some kind of uh, like the beam thing that I was talking about to be able to cast over to uh, NDI to the to the beam in some way with a iOS device or something like that. So there, there's a second hour there, I believe. There's going to be a job. It's going to be somebody's job on set is to just wear the Wayfarer glasses and just sit there and, and watch Focus the whole time. That's awesome. It's a, try, scopes, try it with yeah. your camera. Try it with your camera, CJ, and see what I'm talking about when I, you go into the menus and, and try focusing with it. It's like, whoa, that's sharp. It's. I, so, I had not thought of that even for a second, but as soon as you said camera, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. that's cool. It is cool. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to the next one. Our next question is from Tony Mobley of Noonan, Georgia. What is the panelist's view of the latest version of Mac OS? CJ. Okay, so I uh, did the unthinkable and just installed that right away on my main production machine because uh, I am uh, got to be bleeding edge, I guess. I also uh, 
just within the business, I've got to, uh, we support about 40 or 50 Mac users. And so I always try to have the problems first so that when I get the phone calls, I know how to answer them. Um, all around, it's been the the stuff with the uh, with the reactions where if you do, you know, two devil horns, it comes up and gives lasers behind you, although I've, I've got that turned off, uh, is, is pretty nice. All around, it seems like just they didn't make this really feature heavy. They made it about stability heavy. The one thing um, that threw me is that by default, they now have it that when you click on the desktop, instead of changing the app to Finder, it does what used to be uh, the F11 button, or when they change the keyboard layout, Command F3 to Expose to reveal your desktop. And if you've got a lot of windows open and you click on your desktop and all of a sudden everything flees to the edges, it's uh, it's a little unsettling. So uh, I, a lot of people want to go in and turn that off, but they don't call it Expose anymore. So it's just... It's somewhere in your display settings. But all in all, uh, pleased that there have not been compatibility issues despite kind of a uh, complicated setup. Go ahead, Bill. I had exactly the same experience. The first time I clicked on the desktop and everything left the screen, I went, wait a second. But these are little minor things, and you eventually get to the menu and turn that off so you can get it back the way you're going. The only other thing for me has been uh, plugins. There's a couple of things. And as a matter of fact, since I was having problems with it this morning, the Universal Audio Apollo plugins that I use uh, have not been updated. So you get that red list of I'm starting Final Cut or something, and now there's 12 things that say it's not talking to them. So you have to kind of figure those kind of things out. Um, it's taken me two or three days to get really comfortable with it. But now uh, everything has settled in. I'm still not updated on those Universal Audio plugins. So, But I just, um, in the problem that I'm having today, one of the things I do is download the latest drivers for UA and install them. So let's keep my fingers crossed that everything will be back to normal. But, it, you know, it, it does, it's a few days. This was enough of an update that changed enough things that you have to become comfortable with it. And I know all the gestures, we were having fun with them. You have fun for five minutes and you just turn them off. CJ's having fun with them. CJ, you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up over there? And yeah, sure. So, so the uh, the syntax is one thumbs up gives you a thought bubble. Uh, two thumbs up, you get some uh, fireworks. You get a peace sign, and perhaps internationally this isn't the case because it's not a nice sign everywhere. It's balloons, double peace sign. You've got confetti, double devil horns. You get some rock and roll lasers. And then two thumbs down is the thunderstorm. There you go. Impressed that it just goes right in the middle of the UVC chain, though. I mean, this is uh, this is not the webcam that's built into the computer. That's yeah, wild. I wonder if that says something about the way they plumbed in a way to get overlays in, and if we'll see more quicker uh, lower thirds and things like that that people take advantage to because of that code being there. So we'll, we'll have to see how people use it in the real world. All right, next question. Our next question is from Kenny Hampton of Greenville, Illinois. On, on April 8th of 2024, Nest will discontinue support for the Nest Secure. Will this cause the Nest cameras and various, various devices useless after this date? What is the reason for stopping this support? Is this planned obsolescence? Preto. I have a I have 11 Nest cameras here in my house, and I bought them when they were Drop and Drop Pros. And so they're they're not supporting the drop cam or the drop cam pros anymore. They're still going to support the regular Nest ones that you buy from their website. So that's the only bummer because I've got about two or three still in my surveillance system here that I'm going to have to replace with Nest cameras. So the drop, the drop and the drop pros will be discontinued. And they bought those main, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. Uh, Courtney. Yeah, Nest Secure was their home, uh, Google's home monitoring system. It was debuted in 2017 and dropped in 2020 uh, as a product. Uh, I think Brinks took over the monitoring, and this is what they're discontinuing at the end of this year, is the remote monitoring of your Nest system so that it reports to Brinks will modify, will monitor your, your uh, home security system and call the police if they detect a break-in, et cetera. They're going to stop providing support for it because it is a discontinued product, uh, and there's probably not that much interest in it anymore. So to maintain monitoring for all those subscribers, um, 
uh, Brinks is going to stop doing that. So it'll probably the cameras will probably still work to your local as a uh, as a local security system to record locally and to notify you locally on your local area network. But the remote monitoring by someone who can send the police automatically is probably not going to be available. Jeffrey Powers. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing uh, from there. And, and in all reality, Nest, it, it was it, it was a great idea to uh, bundle together. But when the one at the end of the day, you know, when you think of Nest, you really don't think of security cameras. You think of home protection and, and the in carbon monoxide. You think of uh, uh, adjusting your thermostat and stuff like that. And this is not an unusual thing for companies. I had... Uh, Back in 2017, there was a company called Hive based in the UK, and they're still around, uh, but they discontinued all of their US operations about a year and a half ago, which really sucked because I had some Hive, uh, uh, Hive thermostat and a couple of Hive cameras and, uh, and sensors in there. And in that case, yes, they actually discontinued on everything, so I couldn't even get the app to use it anymore or, or set up the thermostat, uh, so I had to change that out. Uh, but yeah, it's just the bottom line is they looked at the numbers and they said, this is probably not the direction we need to go with Nest. And uh, could it come back? Yeah, there's always a possibility, but the probability is fairly low. Bill Davis. We're, we've been talking about Nest. I use the alternative system. I have Arlo's, uh, Netgear's Arlo system, which is nice in one way. It has all the cameras are completely wireless, so you don't have to run anything anywhere unless you want to. Um, but as they've gone through the iteration of the cameras, uh, the older cameras lose features. They're not compatible. They don't work with the system. So, uh, you know, when you buy into something like this, you're kind of securing the technology at that point. It'll, the if it'll evolve over two or three generations, at least that's been my experience. And then it'll probably stop evolving as they move to different chipsets or something like that. So I think they're all, all the security camera systems are kind of prone to this. I don't know a full solution yet. I'm, I'm probably going to have to get rid of the nine cameras I have eventually because three of them already are obsolete and three more are probably about to go obsolete. It's just the cost of trying to pursue this stuff in, in a rapidly evolving technological market. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and as this technology evolved for, for security systems uh, that report back and notify the police, they were getting so many false alarms off of these that the police have now in most cities they require you to have an alarm license for one thing which you pay for and you will pay for false alarms if they're triggered and uh, and some uh, police municipalities have gone to the point that they will not uh, respond to a uh, automated response from a security system unless it's verified by a human being with visual data. In other words, they can tune in, see the camera, see somebody breaking in, then they'll dispatch somebody. But that requires personnel, and uh, so that's why Brinks is probably discontinuing this, because it costs too much money to keep a person awake and uh, being able to respond to each one of those alarms and check the visuals coming from each alarm to uh, whether or not to dispatch uh, a police person or not. Yeah, we use Sonatrol. That was one of those, they call it a confirmed, and that's the only way that they'll send out the police is with a confirmed. And we had microphones going throughout the entire facility so they could listen it and tell you exactly where. Uh, I'm a big fan of these wise cameras. These things are so crisp. And when the, the AI on them, it, you can get specialized alerts when package drops or motion in a certain area. I'm blown away because I have Arlo and I have Ring, but wise is where it's at. So take a look at those if you're looking for your next, uh, your next step. Um, let's go ahead to the next question. Next question is from Douglas Carmichael. Mark, you mentioned larger HVAC systems being able to adjust airflow in and out. Would that be done with an iPad interface or similar intuitive UI, or would it be a manual process at a desktop PC? So, um, Douglas, there's many different types of systems, and usually in the larger facilities, there'll be a mechanical room, and the mechanical room will have a panel, much like a thermostat in a house where you'll just have a touchpad type screen that's part of, of a proprietary system and you can click your way through different menus and different settings and put things on a schedule. Uh, I have seen uh, one system called the Onuma system, which allows you to put sensors into the system and then you can access the Onuma system from a computer or an iPad. It's just web interface 
basically. And it's a secure interface. And then you can go in and read and monitor in real time from anywhere in the world what the condition of that air is. It does everything from controlling lighting systems to mechanical systems to monitoring whether people are in out of a building. So for large campuses, um, they can go through and start to shut lights off at certain times when they see spaces aren't being used. They can, you know, schedule classrooms and things like that. Yeah. Cool. I had the same experience Mark did. Um, I, we used to run into this a lot when we were shooting with big organizations, big corporations that had many stores. They would almost always have what's called an EMS system, an energy management system. It was run out of the central offices. You have very limited control. Often you'll have the range of maybe six degrees up or down at the store location, but they do not want somebody coming in for the weekend to do stocking and saying, it's hot today. I want to crank this down to 62 degrees for the whole store and burn up a lot of electricity running the uh, the HVAC system 24-7 when it's not supposed to be. So there's usually a pretty big limitation on the amount of local control that's given because the purpose of the system is to, to manage energy costs across the global thing. I know when we used to do Sunday shoots in, for example, a PetSmart store, we would have to go in a week ahead of time and put in a request to change the peripheries, uh, to change the lighting in the store so that it would stay on through a Sunday for our shoot because without doing that and without coordinating it through the central office, there's no way to turn on the lights in the store for an out of normal time. They'd have only stocking lights and none of the actual customer lights that we needed. So it's, it's that kind of system. It's designed for control of costs. Yeah, the technology these days with all these sensors and all these internet of things is, is amazing. Uh, this morning I went to go for a run and I was like, it's raining out. And I was super tired. It's like five in the morning. And uh, I was getting pummeled with droplets. And uh, I realized that it was my sprinkler system. And I was like, what the heck? Why is it going? Why is it going off? And uh, it's controlled by the uh, weather. So it's hooked into Wi-Fi and it knows if it's going to be sunny or if it requires rain. So I, I have the feeling that as people upgrade these systems, because when I got mine, it was one of those old school metal timers and a lot of people are doing this where they just find these things that'll do the new control with sensors so it dials into the into the web looks at the weather looks at the various conditions even zoom has uh during covid they put these sensors on that will measure the oxygen and and the air um how many people are in the room uh and the oxygen sensors are a thing you know it's it's just so internet of things includes these sensors to tell you what's going on, whether it be a water detection leak or any of that. Let's go ahead and jump to the next question. Our next question is from Stefan Fischer of Würzburg, Germany, talking about wireless security cameras. What is the best consumer product, in your opinion today, that does not need a subscription? Jeffrey Powers. Well, Guy, is, uh, Guy mentioned a few products, but the one that I have on a in my area is a company called Eufy, E-U-F-Y. And uh, the one thing that I like about them is they have base stations, the cameras, uh, they, they have independent cameras that, uh, that can go out straight out to the uh, web, but they also have these base stations that you can get to. I have a base station right here that actually I can put in a SSD drive up to two terabytes and, uh, and basically collect all the data from you know any event that happens. I have the uh, doorbell cam, which is a dual camera doorbell cam that has AI ability. So if somebody drops off a package, I'll get notified that there's a package at the front door and it will watch that package until it's picked up. And of course, if somebody else picks it up, then I've got it on camera. Uh, they're both their upper torso and their lower torso as they're, as they're stealing my package. And uh, the only thing that they don't have is any type of PTZ camera. I do have the WISE system, but uh, with their security breaches, I do all my WISE cameras outward facing. I don't like to have them inside the, uh, inside the house, uh, just in case that there's still uh, issues there. They might have resolved them, but that's just, you know, that's just the way I'm thinking. Uh, and then there's another company uh, called EasyViz. And the only thing that I'll say about that is that company is based in China. And whenever you have security information going to China, there's always a chance that government could ask for that information. So be very careful on that uh, when you go to pick which company you're going to get for security cameras. Samuel. 
Uh, well, what I have experience with is a company called Real Link, and it doesn't have any sub subscriptions. They have the wireless and the wired ones. I mostly have experience with the wired ones, but I've been quite happy with them. And uh, the, uh, it's a Chinese company, but n the normal way I use it is I connect it directly to a server that uh, records, so it doesn't get exposed directly to the internet. And Courtney? I use the Wise cameras. They're really cheap. I just got the Wise doorbell here for like $34. That includes a remote chime that you can put somewhere. And uh, the doorbell is quite small, and the wired one will just tie into uh, any 75-volt uh, or 34-volt, uh, depending upon what kind of doorbell system you have. If you had a wired doorbell before, or you can get them with batteries, and they last for a long time. They have uh, onboard uh, recording uh, once they're triggered uh, so that they record to a micro SD card, plus they uh, record to the cloud uh, that you can access from uh, their app without a subscription for up to four, and it'll save the video, I think, for 14 days without a subscription. If you want longer than that, then they do offer a subscription that has more features and uh, longer term storage. Go ahead, Bill. My Arlo system works the same way. I think up to five cameras and um, up to two weeks of storage, it doesn't cost anything. You get beyond that in terms of capacity, and then all of a sudden you're kind of into their paid system. So it works C great. Go ahead, CJ. The other thing that I, I'm also with Bill on the Arlo cameras, uh, I've got five of them, and I really wanted them. What attracted me to Arlo was that they advertise themselves as HomeKit cameras, but gotcha, it's got to have the hub. There's a base station that you need to get in order yeah. to get them into HomeKit. But the other thing, like what Jeffrey said, is that you get the SD card that you can put into that base station and have local recordings without needing a plan. It's not going to do things like package detection and 4K recording if you don't have their secure plan or any recording in the cloud. But if all you're looking for is to have that, that base station somewhere at home, nice to get it off your Wi-Fi network. Nice to have local recordings. Back to oh, Jeffrey. wait, one more thing. The oh. other thing that I love about Arlo is that they you can buy these little magnet mounts, 40 bucks for a set of two, and uh, if you don't like to have cameras inside your house while you're home but want to have cameras inside your house while you're away, it makes it nice that you just reach up, stick it on the wall, you come home, you reach up, you take it off the wall, and you don't have to worry about spying on you while you're home. And Jeffrey. Yeah, Arlo. I used to have Arlo cameras, and the the biggest reason why I switched out of them was the biggest problem with them was they would disconnect and reconnect. And when you disconnect, you actually have to for those cameras that uh, that uh, CJ was showing, uh, you actually have to take out the battery, put it back in. I even had these ones where you could there were batteries that could be plugged in. Uh, but there were a couple times, and and these were big trips that I took. We uh, where we were out of the country for two weeks, and the day after I left, those cameras turned off, and there was absolutely no way to connect them back up to the base station. So that was a few years ago. Uh, I don't know how how that's changed since then, but when it comes to wireless cameras, that's always an issue. The question is, how can you get them back up when you're not in the physical area? to uh, set them back up. And that's what I really like about Eufy. The other thing about the Eufy ones is they run on a slightly different mega, uh, slightly different Wi-Fi signal. So if it won't get oversaturated by 2.4 or 5 gigahertz uh, wireless. Uh, so they'll always stay connected. And as CJ said, they're relieving your router especially even with the uh, the AX models, which now can connect up to 50 to 75 devices, it's still a good idea to have a device that can connect up four or five things and then send one signal straight to the router. And in this case, it would have to be an Ethernet signal rather than a Wi-Fi. That one, I just want to add one more thing. If you do have one of the Alexa shows, uh, one of the nice things is that you could just say, show me the front door and it'll sh bring up your your camera, or whatever you named it. So if you have these systems that are embedded with the A-Lady, as Courtney likes to call her, um, you can display those rather quickly, which is pretty nice. Uh, let's go ahead and hit uh, Craig's question. Craig McFarland from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm jealous, Craig. I just saw the Doobie Brothers who were amazing, but I almost missed out. What sites do you use to keep an eye out for tours of favorite bands coming to your area? Go ahead, Courtney. 
Most uh, large municipalities like Boston or Los Angeles, Los Angeles, um, you know, has a website on events, Los Angeles events. So you can find out uh, who's playing today, uh, what's going on, what our major events are on a daily basis or look at a calendar for any of the upcoming days. So check, we just type in what's happening in and then fill in the name of your city. Also, Google does a good good uh, interface to Bard these days, and so it uses AI to find out who's playing, and it does a great great job at, at filtering out, you know, if you want to say what bands are playing in such and such a venue this week, it will search, find out the venue, and uh, show you what their schedule is. It does a really good job. Bard is amazed. It doesn't hallucinate too much, so it doesn't say, you know, the Beatles are coming back on Thursday. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, that would be interesting if the Beatles were coming back. Um, you know, if you're a fan of the band, a serious fan of the band, I would think that you're already hooked into their fan network. And I, I, the one, honestly, sometimes better tickets are available if you're a member of what used to be called their fan club or whatever their social media thing is, because they will at least let those people know ahead of time. Outside of that, I find I'm more interested in the venue now than who's playing there. Um particularly band of, of that era. I think Tom Johnson still with Doobie Brothers, but a lot of people like Michael McDonald and other people who were there during their heydays have kind of moved on from those bands. And so you never know really what you're getting. If they're professional musicians and they've got a professional touring show and they're still selling a lot of tickets, it should be a great show regardless. And you get to hear the music you want to hear. But that's just something I'm paying attention to. And there are a couple of venues, the Radio Shell, which is new in San Diego being one of them, that I'll see anything there because even if it's some odd Chinese acrobat group, it's such a fabulous facility that I know I'll probably enjoy the show. So I'm funny that way. Go ahead, CJ. Uh, one more that I've had some success with over the years. I love seeing live shows. So I'm, and I'm not sure where I found this, but there's a website called bandsintown.com. And it lets you say where you are and what kind of music you like. And you'll get a, a little email blast that'll say who's going to be around. And if you flag a specific artist, then you'll... It'll make the, the the net a little bit wider in terms of how far geographically from you uh, that it'll show you notifications or uh, alerts about something. So if there's an app for the iPhone, or you can just get an email about it if you don't mind getting more emails, bandsintown.com. Thank you for that. Let's go ahead and move on to Tony's question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia, wants to know, how the Blackmagic Design Camera update improves the app on the iPhone. That new update. Anybody get the new update to camera? I have not. When did it come out? Is it just the last few days? It's interesting because at Zoomtopia, I wound up talking with the folks at Blackmagic, and we were kind of in a group. There's Dave Brady and I, and we we're looking at it, and we we're asking, does it shoot directly to the cloud? And it it, it is one of those things where with that, uh, one of the later updates is that you can uh, save it first and then say in the settings, automatically update, upload to cloud. So if you have an editor or somebody that pushes your content out for you, you could have it begin to upload and you can choose whether you want it over cellular or over Wi-Fi. So there, there's a couple of little things that have changed. I'll have to go and I don't know when this update, this other update came out, uh, but it's the future. <laughs> it's it's really interesting what Blackmagic is doing with this app uh, because as we know, Filmic Pro used to cost money and now this one's free and it does a lot of what Filmic used to do, including clean HDMI out. For those of you who haven't downloaded, it's free and now your phone has HDMI out. Jeffrey, you want to go ahead and add on to that? Yeah. Uh, so I called up the uh, page. Basically, it's saying that they're doing a lot of more support for iOS 14, uh, supports for recording at 23.98, 2997, 5994. Uh, support for tentacle sync e for external time code support for till uh, there's a bunch of stuff uh, uh, dealing with HDMI dealing with iPhone 14 uh, I'll put the link in in Wakana so you guys do you say can, 14 uh, and not it. iOS 15 I would have assumed with the HDMI or with the, the no new no port I, I said iPhone iPhone 14 not iOS or maybe oh, I did okay. say iOS I meant iPhone 14. A little bit more so support not for the iPhone new 14. USB C port on because that's what I thought they would have updated. If anything, is uh, writing to the new USB C port on the bottom of the new the newest iPhones. Yeah, that's possible. But uh, right now, that's that's hmm. what they have for their one point one. And like I said, I put the link in in Makana. You can read through the whole thing. Great. Let's jump over to uh, Douglas's question. 
So Douglas is back and he has a question that says, does the on-camera reactions feature of Mac OS Sonoma work with virtual camera devices like Mimo Live? I'd imagine that it would because it's controlled by the UVC. CJ, do you, do you happen to know, or Jeffrey? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, yeah actually, yeah, uh, we, we were, uh, we were in a room, uh, John Preto and I, uh, were in a room a, a couple days ago and somebody came in and they were having problems because of blur, but they were using eCam. They were using, uh, they were using the regular camera and they were getting the reactions through there. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next question. Next question is from Brian Swartz of Baltimore, Maryland. What have you found to be the best film scanning service for scanning large, medium format color slides? <laughs> I laugh because this used to be my job back in the 90s. Uh, go ahead, CJ. Okay, I misread the question when I raised my hand. I don't know of a service, uh, nor do, depending on how precious the photos are, do I uh, love the idea of giving my negatives to somebody else. Uh, but I did want to say I had a lot of great experience with the Epson Perfection photo scanners. They've got, they actually come with little templates for you to put in uh, your film. And then it has a nice uh, piece of software that comes with it that lets you do things like dust and scratch correction, uh, balance your colors and things like that. Uh, I, I remember going to my mom and I was like, hey, uh, I, I know that you've got this big box of photos, but do you, you know, where are all the negatives? She's like, oh, we threw those away. We didn't think we needed them. And I was like, oh. But it was the, the ones that we did have, though, uh, it was really breathtaking how much uh, detail and, and life that this scanner was able to get out of the film. So the uh, Epson, Epson Perfection Series scanners and the templates that come with them to, to hold the film, just can't recommend them enough. Go ahead, uh, Jeffrey Powers. Uh, Walgreens, they still have a photo lab. They still, some of the, some of the stuff they have actually have to go out for if it's old, uh, uh, film strips, uh, trying to process that. But if you want to get, uh, stuff scanned in, they even have photo retouches, retouching services through there. Uh, so you can check them out if that, uh, works best for you. Giuliani. So, um, Epson scanners are great. If you have a Mac, there's a piece of software, an app called ViewScan, and ViewScan lets you gives you immense control over the different types of things that you can adjust at the scan, and it goes up to a very high resolution. I know we have thousands of color slides here because we're an old architecture firm, and some of the slides we scan in get to be like 100 megs in size, and the, the clarity and the cleanup, it does this all automatically. So it's called ViewScan, V-U-E-S-C-A-N. Me. And I don't know if they're available in Baltimore, but uh, in Los Angeles, there is a home scanning service. They come to you called Home Archive, home scanning service. They come to you in case you don't want to mail your precious photos. You don't want to risk big them. You don't have to want to invest in some scanning hardware to do it yourself. They'll come to you with the scanning hardware. They'll scan in the stuff and uh, give you back uh, a digital copy. Or you can send it to them or they can... Uh, pick it up with a, uh, a registered uh, delivery service that, uh, oops, sorry, that will uh, take care of your priceless memories and uh, guarantee that you get it back, you know. I, I would hate to risk the way the post office loses stuff these days. I don't know if I want to send the only copies of negatives through the mail, you know. So buying your own scanner or having one of these in-home archives uh, is, a, is a way to go. There's a company called Legacy Box that you mail in stuff and they send you back a DVD. That's another possibility, but you do have to give up control of your precious items to them to have them scanned in. All right, and the last question of the hour. Okay, Douglas is back. Why do you think Apple's video processing features such as reactions and presenter overlay only are only available on Apple Silicon Macs when Mimo Live and apps like it have provided similar functionality on Intel Macs for years. Go ahead, Bill. Apple's notorious for not wanting to put in features that drag down performance for everybody else. And I think that the new uh, very large scale integration on the Apple Silicon things with all the, the GPUs and everything literally on the chip 
means that they're confident that they can pull off all those effects without bogging down or slowing down everything else. So I think that's why they limit it to just that. I, you know, it probably might work on the other thing, but it might also delay things microseconds. And sometimes they just don't want to do that. Go ahead, CJ. The other thing to keep in mind is that one of the basic features that they give, which is this portrait mode, which uh, does an artificial bokeh, was developed on the iPhone first for the camera app. So it seems like they're using a lot of the plumbing that they started for uh, the, uh, the uh, neural algorithm or computational photography stuff that they put into the iPhone's camera. They're now borrowing some of that same foundation and bringing it over to the Mac which means that it's not written for Intel. So if you want your studio light or you want your portrait mode or whatever else, um, they're not having to start from square one. They're just kind of borrowing from their code base on the iPhone. And Courtney, take us home. And remember, Apple became the richest company on earth by selling you proprietary hardware at a 40% markup. And so they want to move you to the latest and greatest version because they make more money. Simple answer. Coming from Courtney, uh, Beeling by Courtney. So <laughs> the PC guy gives the, the last answer. All right, that ends the show for today. Uh, for announcements, we've got uh, today's monthly panelist meeting with Alex will be immediately after the show. Uh, that'll be at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you're already a panelist, uh, the Zoom link is in the panelist Discord. Sign up for those posted, interested posted in the daily email and the office hours chat in Discord. Today we traveled uh, via the Tlaloc tra <laughs> Traversal. Uh, let's see, that is, how many bananas is that? Uh, 822 million bananas for scale. All right, thanks for watching, guys, and we will catch you in After Hours. Don't go staring at the sun right now because it's going behind the moon. Maybe it's being eclipsed by all those bananas. Can you get That's banana shaped right. glasses? Guy, good, good job hitting the uh, 11 o'clock turnover. Whew. And the next man up. <laughs> Thunderbolt cables make me nervous now. I have so much Back running us. on a single Thunderbolt cable. Back us with a 